Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming out and sharing your morning uh, in this talk. Let's just get started because we have a lot to get through. So let's start here. <clears throat> we start at uh, T0, and this is a very special kind of T0 because before this T0, absolutely nothing exists, not even the concept of existence. Uh, this T0 is the beginning of the universe, and uh, let's see what we know and what we do not know about it. As it turns out, what happened in the first uh, millionth of a second, we have absolutely no idea. Whoever tells you they know, they are lying. <laughs> we have no clue what happened in the first millionth of a second uh, of the beginning of the universe. Apparently, at 10 to the minus 6 seconds after this Big Bang, we do know, or we have a much better grasp of what actually was happening. So there was this singularity, there was this point, and then, boom, I don't even know if it made a sound. No one was there to hear it. And very shortly after, at about a thousand seconds after this explosion happened, we had a st a starting having uh, heavy particles become b forming one another. And a very special one is this one, lithium, so the third, the number three in the periodic chart of elements. And I find something remarkable. Uh, if you yourself or you know someone that is unfortunate enough to have a bipolar disorder, you may know that they can be given a medicine based on lithium to uh, improve uh, the, the, the firing on the brain. Nobody really knows how it works, but it does work. I find it remarkable that something that was created 10 to the 3 seconds after the Big Bang, and that's when it was created, it was not created yesterday, it has been alive for 13.8 billion years, can affect our way of thinking, can affect our very existence in such remarkable ways. Uh, and this element is very special. Of course, there's the lithium batteries, but you know, people, computers. This is the oldest selfie that, ev that ever exists. This is the microwave background radiation. It is an actual picture, so it's not an optical picture, it's on a microwave. And what it shows is the difference in temperature in the whole sky that we have from a mission called WMAP. Uh, what you are seeing here is a, a variation of plus minus 200 microkelvins. And where you see the hot spots, the little bit hotter spots, is when matter started to accrete to form what we now know as galaxies, planets, etc. So we keep moving along on this uh, uh, evolution of the universe. And then we enter to 150 to 800 million years after this T0. And we have these uh, elements here, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. And those are the blocks of life. Life cannot exist without these uh, elements. And they were created just very, very early on the beginning of the universe. And again, we come from these atoms that were created in the, during that process. Tagging along, let me skip a few millions of years, and we come to two billion years after that T0. And what we have is the starting the creation of uh, macro structures. So there is a certain regions of the universe are more dense in matter than other regions, and this the, the gravity already exists and it starts coming together. And we have these clouds starting to come together and start forming the stuff. And then in about four billion years after that T0, we have the galaxies. As you know, and you may have seen this picture before, was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. They just pointed at a very tiny part of the universe and just let it there with a very long exposure. And every single tiny dot that you see there is a galaxy. A galaxy like ours with billions of stars, with the, a massive history, impossible to understand exactly what's going on in there. So we are only four billion years after that very special kind of uh, T0. Let me skip two billion years and get to a special galaxy that was, you know, it was just a bunch of gas and particles moving and at some point it stabilized along an axis, so its angular momentum was starting to stabilize. And this stabilization enabled the creation of our sun. So about nine billion years after that T0, some of that gas started coalescing together, it keeps coming together, and when enough of it comes together into a single point, gravity starts causing the fusion, and then there's heat, and uh, we have a star that it was a special star because it is our sun. Then about 0.25 uh, billion years after that, so 9.25 billion years ago, in the remaining of that star, the sun, a little planet was starting to be formed, and that was planet Earth, that's our home, about 9.25 billion years after that T0. And everything was going great, it was hot because it had been accreting, but it was, you know, everything was safe and beautiful until, you know, something hit us, something probably the size of Mars, and uh, then, you know, uh, everything 
uh, had to start over from scratch, but this gave us something very special because it gave us our moon. And without our moon, our planet would just not uh, be able to sustain life. You know, it gives us the tides, etc. And you know, we just keep moving along and about 10.7 billion years uh, into the evolution, our planet had these um, bacteria that were formed. The very special property of these bacteria, the cyanobacteria that they call them now, is that they were able to produce oxygen. So then our atmosphere was capable of producing oxygen. And uh, life started to be creating. As you can imagine, I'm skipping through a few details. <laughs> uh, 13.4 billion years later, on Earth, we had sharks. And that's my best rendition of a shark. Sorry, I could not draw anything better, so just imagine <laughs> the shark. I find it remarkable that sharks are older than trees. Uh, sharks have been around for a long, long, long time, and that is 13.4 billion years after that T0, we got sharks on our planet. Then a little bit later, we got dinosaurs. So that's a T-Rex. Uh, that's an actual skeleton. I took the picture. Uh, well, not me. I took the picture from the internet. I didn't take the picture of the T-Rex. And then everything was going great. We had the dinosaurs, and they were <clears throat> you know, moving along and doing their Jurassic stuff. And then we had a, a comet here in Mexico. I'm from Mexico, so please don't, uh, don't, don't take it on me. Uh, it wasn't my fault. So in the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, this comet came, or that is the most accepted theory, at, uh, at least. And what you're seeing there is some uh, gravity variations on that uh, Chicolub crater that is there. And that wiped off all the dinosaurs. Well, not all of them. Some of them evolved to be birds. Talk about bad luck. And then 13.77 billion years ago, that very special T0 is when modern human anatomy came about. And this, you know, I'm skipping over the Neanderthal, etc. But that is the modern human anatomy. And then 13.8 billion years, we come to today. And we come again to this little dot. And that little dot is what our understanding of everything that happened before, all this story that we went through, that's what it would be if we did not go and explore space. So it is very important that we choose in this, that in this, this junction that we find ourselves. We just you know, assume that something happened, assume that we're here for some reason that we philosophically will find out, or we go out to space and try to determine exactly what went on. And this is when we enter into the exploration. So this motivates uh, exploration of space, understanding all this history, what happened. We have been alive for a negligible amount of all this history, but I find it remarkable that we have the capacity to understand everything that happened before. If you're interested in the year-by-year -year history, good luck. There's lots of books. I all honestly don't understand at all, but let's try to see how do we go about opening up these dots, which at this point represent our understanding. So the first one, again, you know, skipping over a few other important contributors. The first one that unlocked the universe, in my taste, was Isaac Newton. Uh, of course, a, a very uh, observant and very capable mind that decided to write his Principia Mathematica, and with that, really told us in his three laws what's up with this that we call existence and reality and physics. And uh, one diagram that I believe it was drawn by, by he himself, uh, it's the initial idea of getting out of Earth and going into space. So what you are seeing there, it's a little mountain, that point V, and essentially the way he reasoned was, if I grab a ball and I throw it or whatever, I grab something and I throw it on top of a mountain, it's going to fall. If I you know, throw it harder, it's going to travel farther, so on and so forth. Then at some point, I'll hit it, I'll throw it with such a speed that by the time it, it falls, it won't have time and it will hit me in the back of the head. Oops, sorry. And uh, that is uh, a satellite. So, so he came up with the concept of a satellite just by imagining, you know, throwing from the top of that mountain. And you see you have that D, E, F, G, etc. And then until you come and uh, hits it to the back of the head. So in a space, stuff doesn't orbit. I mean, it, we call it orbiting. But what a stuff is doing, stuff is falling. It, and it but doesn't fall down. It falls around. And then you have to have a minimum speed, and your speed determines the period with which you order, you orbit the, the body, um, etc. So this falling around is uh, the original conception of maybe we can get out of here and into that space. Then the fooling around, because as it turns out, nothing really works like this. And uh, I cannot even start to enter into the uh, special and general relativity. 
Newton is the one who gave us the laws of gravity and calculus. I know, Leibniz, you know, two teams. Uh, but uh, Einstein, uh, uh, Einstein theory is really a much better representation. But as it turns out, and I hope you can see today, uh, with Newton's laws, we can do remarkable, remarkable work. And uh, so there's just that guy. I want to acknowledge him. But uh, we won't touch a lot into his theory. Ochin Harasho, for those uh, of you of, uh, <laughs> from Russia, shortly after you know these ideas, we, have, we got the launch of Sputnik, 1957, the first uh, man-made object, human-made object that went onto space. It was a, an amazing thing. It, it uh, instilled fear in the United States. It instilled awe, and we quickly had to respond. So then uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where I used to work, uh, decided that, well, the military decided that somebody had to build a satellite and somebody had to launch it and they picked JPL and then uh, shortly after the launch of Sputnik, uh, JPL launched Explorer 1, the first American satellite. And then the, you know, the race was on and the race was thankfully for exploration. Sure, the original motivation was the Cold War and we had all these issues going on, but it was wonderful that in this show of capability between two countries, we got to discover so much. So let's see the, the, the force of math. Um, just you know, a little bit going back to high school, you get the rate of change of momentum <clears throat> has to be equal to the forces acting on an object, right? And then you can say like, okay, well, the momentum is the mass times the velocity. And then you can say that the mass has to be constant because you know something is not excreting matter. And so you can take it out of the derivative and you get this mass times the derivative of the velocity with respect to time has to be equal to the forces. So that's the force of math. And then, on the other hand, you have the, the Newton's laws of gravity that tells you that the force of gravity between two objects is the product of their masses divided by the square of the distance between them times this constant, uh, the, the gravitational constant. But we also, from the previous slide, know what the force is supposed to be from, uh, for, from a calculus perspective. So we can equal those two you know, equations. And we end up with that the derivative of the velocity has to be, as you know, the little m is, is in two sides, so I cancel it is this uh, gravitational constant times the mass of the uh, big body divided by the square of the distances. And then if you notice the last V uh, is now in bold because now it's a vector. And the reason why I made it a vector is because I just multiplied it by the, by the line that joins the two centers. And I put a minus because the force is attracted. So it's attracting and that force is along that line. So now we have a vector. So this is great. Now that means that we have six differential equations to describe the motion of the spacecraft. We have the derivative of position, by definition is the velocity, and the derivative of the velocity, which is the acceleration, is this minus mu, which now is g times m, uh, times r over r cubed. So now this is a vector, six differential equations for that point mass. I'm not gonna be talking about the attitude of the spacecraft, which has the, the other, other six differential equations and other stuff. So that's the math of force. And this is a, a, a fool. I, I entered JPL in 2009 and I said, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna understand everything there is to understand about a spacecraft. I'm gonna know everything there is to know about a space travel. That's my first day. I'm proudly holding Cassini's navigation program and I was gonna do the maneuvers so that Cassini would uh, you know, execute its merry way around Saturn. I was such a fool. Those differential equations that I show you, the six ones, you can try it yourself and I'll post some code on GitHub so that you can do it. What I did here is I just tried to say, okay, give me the position of the Earth and the Moon, well, the Moon relative to the Earth, at the, be at the beginning of CP CppCon 2016. And then just use the GM of the Earth, that mu stuff, and just simulate those differential equations just forward up until today, so, so one year. Uh, do they predict? So let's see here. If you, I'll, I'll use the, uh, the cursor here. Uh, we can see that in the beginning, the two lines are really riding on each other. So that's pretty good. But then, you know, shortly after, what is this? About a month, I'm already off by what? Like four or five? What are the units? Earth radii? So I'm off by two Earths. That's uh, <laughs> probably, probably a, a, an unacceptable distance. And of course, as, as, as I move on, you know, the, the, the error just becomes, we should say, astronomical. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty bad. Or is it pretty bad? So we can take the two uh, attitudes, right? It can be awful because, you know, by the, by the time we are in 365 days, I'm off by like 60 uh, Earth radii. So essentially, I'm pointing you the other way. Uh, so that's, that's bad. 
But I also find that it's really encouraging that with so little differential equations and so little knowledge, you can predict it for 30 days. So that's, that's pretty cool. And, and again, no, no cheating here is just grab whatever. It also has an analytical solution. I'll, I won't enter it, but you, know, can, you can solve Kepler's equation for the two-body problem. But you can just grab the equations, put them in Python, use SciPy, OD, int, and just propagate them, and you get that. Uh, no, you know, whatever, 20 lines of code or something like that. That gives you 30 days of where the moon is. So the force of reality is that, of course, that's not how stuff moves in space. We not only have the force of the central body, we also have many other forces. And the, the reality is that you have to be adding these forces onto that vector to, uh, to be able to really reflect everything that is act acting on the object that you are trying to model the motion for. So what kind of, or what kind of uh, accelerations or what kind of forces are acting on the body? We have many. I'm going to try to enumerate a few. Uh, we have end body perturbations. Uh, the, the first one, you have you know, not only the moon, but you also have the sun, which kind of matters, considering that it accounts for about 99% of the mass of the entire solar system. It doesn't seem uh, reasonable to ignore the sun. We have uh, the moon doesn't really orbit the Earth. They orbit the barycenter of one another. Also, they are not perfect spheres, so we have uh, this gravitational potential that has to be modeled differently. Uh, big bodies have a bulge in the middle, like, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> and they are squished at the top. And then there are other bodies that are not even round, that they just have a, you know, an irregular shape like this, the smaller asteroids. Uh, if there are rings, like in Saturn, for example, the, the rings do exert a gravitational perturbation. They are quite heavy. And of course, the potential of the ring system is not the same as the potential of a sphere. So you have to model that as well. You have the solar radiation pressure. Like it is, uh, there's literal solar wind that it is pushing on the faces mechanically and you know, moving everything forward. And you only need very tiny accelerations over an extended period of time to have this drift that keeps moving on. We have relativistic corrections, so it is true, and they do matter, and we do account for them when we model the spacecraft motion. They are not as important when you are just considering short-term variation, but when you are considering very precise timing, for example, in the GPS constellation around Earth, or stuff that is very close to the sun, for example, Mercury, you just cannot account for their motion without correcting for relativity. Uh, we have atmospheric drag for satellites that are low in the Earth orbit, or if you're trying to enter into Mars, you need to take into account the, the atmosphere. And it doesn't have to be a thick atmosphere. It can be completely a very thin atmosphere. But again, the small effects over an extended period of time can make a lot of difference. And of course, you have the spacecraft thrust. You need to know when to fire your engines, in what direction to fire your engines, and uh, with the ISP, the, everything that's going to happen, how aligned you are. And then you start putting this all together onto that right-hand side that I showed, this sum of forces. So as I will show later, our code is just essentially that. It's just a way to model each one of these different things that they can be modeled in different manners and just adding them onto that vector of forces so that you end up with differential equations that then you use a good propagator and you go ahead and solve it. But that's not all of it. We also have a lot of frames of reference. Uh, the only way that Newton's laws work is if they are in an inertial frame. That what, what that means is that frame cannot be accelerated, and we also know that doesn't exist. That's just a construction, you know, of the human mind. So what, what we do is we say, okay, refer the motion to the barycenter of the solar system. We'll take that, that as inertial. Then imagine that there is a clock ticking there. So that's, you know, put it there. And however that clock ticks, that's our clock. And then everything you do something away from the solar system barycenter with a clock ticking on the solar system barycenter has to start you know, taking into account the different frames of reference, uh, the, the relationship between the clocks themselves, etc. Uh, we have different shape models, as I mentioned before. Not everything is a sphere. Not everything can be modeled with spherical harmonics. Sometimes they use plates. Sometimes they use triangles. Sometimes they use cubes. So we have many different ways to model the shape of an object. Temperature models. How is the temperature radiating on the spacecraft? There's many ways to do that. Radiation models, something like Jupiter, has a, the strongest radiation in the solar system. And uh, you, you need to do all these models, and then these are represented by a collection of data. It's like a shell that you have to interpolate and find the correct shell, and then find the eight corners, and then interpolate like this, and then like that, and then like this, and you have lots of data. 
So quite complicated. Add it to dynamics. I said, you know, I'm not going to mention it, but you know, you have a body that is, uh, you know, distributed, and it's not the same being like this than being like that, and where's the center of mass, and so on. Uh, aero thermodynamics. If you're entering into Mars, uh, you're hypersonic relative to the CO2 atmosphere of Mars, so you are heating very fast. You are also dropping heat very fast from the heat shields, and uh, of course, you're getting mechanical uh, motion on the spacecraft. You got to model the instruments, so you have to model the camera, the aberration, the temperature, where is it looking at, like whether you're pointing it correctly. And not everything is a camera, some are radars, and so on and so forth. Uh, all the telecom, uh, you know, you have your data, your hard drive is full, you're in Jupiter, and you got to give it to someone, and it's not going to be FedEx. So you have to find Earth. <laughs> you look at Earth, and then you first look at the sun, and then you, within the sun you look at Earth. And then you point your antenna, and then hopefully the Earth is spinning at the. Uh, 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 is, uh, well, not hopefully. You of course model that. That's kind of someone's job uh, to to make sure that the, there's an antenna ready to receive this communication. So that's the job of the Deep Space Network uh, from JPL as well. They have three antennas: California, Madrid, and uh, Goldstone and, and uh, Canberra, Australia. Ab about 120 degrees separated by one another, so that when the Earth rotates, there's always antennas listening to to space. You got to model the ground the stations themselves, like, you know, because the, the ground does move up and down, and, uh, and that matters. Even if it's 60 centimeters with the antenna, you, it does matter uh, where the ground moved. And there's a, a, an international organization based in France, the International Earth Rotation Service, that gives you the parameters of the, that model where Earth is and how is the, the Earth's inertia uh, tensor in that moment. So you have to use it. I think they update it once a week, uh, I guess, depending what kind of work you're trying to do. And then the avionics. Everything that I've been talking about is just how the stuff moves, like, like the physics of the thing, not how you make it do that. That's all the avionics system. I believe there was a talk yesterday, which I'm looking forward to watching YouTube. Unfortunately, could not attend it. But everything that goes into the flight computer, I'm not talking about that. That is massively complex. It's uh, an entire topic in and of itself. And I would say about 40% of, of the cost of a space mission is developing, ver verifying, and validating the avionic system. And many other things that I'm not even taking into account right now. So the computers to the rescue. What we have here are the original computers. Those are uh, employees of JPL back in the day. That they were the ones that had to figure out this whole thing. You know, the, the people would come, give them the models, and they would, by hand, go and compute everything and just had their summing uh, or their adding machines and they had to like figure out. And I've been told, maybe that's ap apocryphal, but that they, the way they would propagate differential equations was literally sitting behind one another and then just do one step of the Runge Cuda and just passing it behind to do the next <laughs> step so that people could verify and then the last one would come to the front and just you know continue the propagation like this. Like you can imagine your software doing, well, it was real people. And they were called the computers. And maybe you have, you're aware of the movie that is out right now that kind of talks a little bit about this. So the computers to the rescue, they are working, but you know, who comes to the rescue of the computers? So the computer itself, the digital computer, is the one that came to the rescue of the computer's people. And uh, now we have there uh, one of these computers, and how do we talk to that adorable thing? With Fortran. That is how we talk about, uh, how we initially talk about to, to the computer, to the digital computer, with Fortran. I don't need to go through what Fortran is, you know, this uh, initial, you know, the domain specific uh, uh, just for scientific computing. It was great. Uh, this is for that computer, the IBM 704, which is actually that computer that I'm showing in that picture. And uh, I just thought this was so funny. Uh, I'll give you a, a minute, uh, 30 seconds to read it. You know, uh, any programming language that says stuff like that should be looked at with a skepticism. So did the value of pi ever change? <laughs> <laughs> I heard that we're planning to move it to three, just, you know. <laughs> oh, yes, that's true. So now, Fortran is remarkable for many reasons. But now I'm going to try to explain why is it so prevalent in rocket science. And it's probably something uh, that, that you have not considered. So this is an actual uh, Fortran example, is uh, in the notation of, of modern Fortran. So, you know, you, you're implicit none. Uh, I hate that. Yeah, I hear a real foo, an integer bar, and a logical, like a bool, bass. And then there is this thing called a name list. A name list in Fortran, yeah, you just declare, you give it a name. In this case, I called it my data. 
And then here I just said foo, bar, and bas, these three variables that I declared on top, are part of that name list. So now you can read that name list from a standard input. So there is a specific format that is called the NML format, the name list format, that when it, it's read, it will populate those variables. And similarly, you can just, uh, I, I don't show it here, but you can spit a name list in the name list format. And here I'm just spitting it in a, oh, by the way, Fortran doesn't print it, it spits. Um, uh, I, I'm here, I'm just putting what I read, and then that's, that's the program. So for, this is the actual format itself. You have an ampersand, the name of the name list, the three uh, variables that I had there, and then this uh, terminator. And you can just do it right now. And, uh, and here is uh, what it had actually read. And if you had, say, save the, the variables in a name list format, you would have gotten out something that looks like this. So why do I say this is such an important thing? So this is how actually stuff goes down in, down in the trenches. People come with an algorithm to simulate something very complex. Inevitably, because of all the things that I told you before, that you have to model the clocks and the frames and the constants and the parameters and the ephemeris, then you have this massively parametric problem. And everything has to be consistent. If you use the masses from one calculation, they all have to be from that calculation. So they have to be self-consistent. You cannot use the masses computed from here with the radii computed from there. So it has to be everything consistent. So what people would do is just grab this massive name list, put everything in them, and just distribute it to one another, grab their program, at the top and start saying, you know, MA1A, MA1B, MA1C, and, and all the parameters, hundreds of them, and then just produce some documentation, which is better than nothing, and distribute it to other people. So then you would grab that name list, do something, save it, and you had another name list, and you have this collection of text files that represent your entire design. Now, because they are text files and they, have, they can have comments on them, they can be version controlled, then people became used to working like this. As soon as you write a Fortran program, you have automatically a parser for a language that people understand. People who went to university know how to write this. People know how to read it. You can copy and give it the meaningful names that, you know, my rocket design v1.2 underscore good. Uh, you, can, you can give it that name and people just keep them. And then people write software, they're like, oh, it's very easy, it's just a name list. I contend that the reason that people use Fortran is because uh, the engineers can do this. They, they, they don't have to worry about GUIs, they don't have to worry about input. And it's also a very simple language. It's very straightforward. You just add, multiply, divide, matrix multiply, and uh, you have a, something, something to report, speed out your name list. So I found that remarkable. Now, you, you'll notice that that was in a single precision. You can just change something in the compiler. It'll do a double precision. So it has some sort of uh, compiler parameterization as well, which also turns out to be uh, important. And then there's a, a field of dreams, right? So uh, then there was also the BLAS, the basic linear algebra subroutines that were also massively important because they provided a common language to describe algebraic operation. There was BLAS level one, level two, level three. Then we had LAPAC. And then we had the Netlib, this uh, repository of numerical software. So then more people relied on the software available on Netlib that was in Fortran. And then people knew the name list and the, the, the names were already there. Then uh, Clive Moller invented MATLAB, which was nothing but a way to speak to Fortran. That was it. It was originally just a wrapper around uh, the, the Netlib and, you know, just literally Laypack and Blast. And then we had this book, Numerical Recipes, that had a lot of stuff in Fortran. So people needed to do, you know, Chevy Chev interpolation, they would just hit that book, find out how it's done, and it was done in Fortran. Then later, uh, the authors did produce uh, C and C++ versions. So, you know, if you build it, they will come. They created an ecosystem. And the problem is, if they come, they won't leave. <laughs> and, and that is exactly what happened. So nobody defends uh, the current practice with Fortran. I don't think anybody would defend it, but people are comfortable. But it's not that Fortran is, is bad, it is not. It has many, it is not meant for user interaction. You cannot interact with the command line, for example. It has many bad things. It's excellent for strictly numerical computing. The problem is people don't use it for that. People use it for everything else in addition to numerical computing. So it's been very difficult, uh, at least for me, to try to convince people to continue doing their Fortran calculations in Fortran because indeed it is a very good language and people know it. But you know, just put the wrapper in a more robust language like C++ that probably you've heard of. So dreaming a solution. Uh, this is you know, uh, approximately how a, program, uh, how a problem solution for somebody that works uh, in a space or I guess anywhere uh, looks like. You have some time allocated to the setup of the problem 
Another time, once you set up the problem in the whatever system you're using to solve it, you actually solve, so that's the computing time, and then you have to post-process your solution, analysis, et cetera. Now, I believe that currently what's happening is computing is really not, not that big of a deal for the most part. In 90% of the cases that I have seen in uh, rocket science-like calculations, computing is not the issue. There are special problems for which computing is massive. Of course, absolutely. But for the most part, in the day-to-day -day life of an engineer, he or she needs to set up the problem in a massive amount of time. When it's finally set up and verified that it is the actual correct problem, then they solve it, which is relatively small in comparison. And then you have this massive set of results that you have to post-process then. So people have been focusing too much on that middle box that is, I believe, small in the 90% of cases. And I believe forgetting at the other two things that are outside. Just let me set up my problems correctly. Let me ensure that my setup is correct. Just go ahead and solve it. And then give me the tools and flexibility to analyze my results and make educated uh, you know, conversations about this. Um, so what did uh, JPL did? I must say, none, none, of it, none of the C++ code that I'm presenting here was done by me. This is all done by JPL. Many people, two wonderful in particular, Ted Drain and Scott Evans, uh, they came up about 11 years ago, maybe even more, I don't even know, but uh, at the turn of the, of the century. They came up with this new system called Monty, well, Monty Python, really, that's the, uh, the name of the uh, mission operations and navigation trajectory, something, whatever. You know, they just wanted to call it Monty Python. <laughs> and uh, so they, they, it's, it's built around a concept called a BOA, a Binary Object Archive. And what a BOA is, is essentially like a, a game component, uh, entity component architecture that everything only has its name and a set of properties. And you have a trajectory that can have a central body, you know, orbiting bodies and a polynomial and everything's like a string. And then in the BOA, you store those strings so you can exchange BOAs with one another. And they kind of, I believe, hit bullseye. And everything is written in C++. And, uh, and this is the, just, uh, I'm illustrating approximately how it's used. So you can just, you know, just load a BOA from a file. It's a, it's a binary format. You can store a new design element in that BOA. It will immediately be available to you and also will be written into the BOA. So you can use it in another process. Uh, you can find, uh, it kind of handles all the complexity for you. In this case, we have this ET, it's called ephemeris time. It's some sort of dynamical clock. Uh, you, it can parse the string and now it allows you, that it forces you to specify a clock and you'll see this, thing right here, it manages units. Massively important. Uh, it's not boost units, it's another uh, units library like within the Monty system. And uh, it is massively important, it simplifies things dramatically. And uh, as you know, uh, we did lose a spacecraft because we were not careful about that. And then it can, you know, if you say, okay, I want to find the occultation, of the, of the sun, the, the, the sun has to be here, the moon has to be in front, as seen from the DSS-14 station, with that context in that BOA, and then this is a time span, and then it just, you know, give you the events. So you become very productive. But this is C++, which I love, of course, that's why I'm here. But not everyone does. So BOAs are not the only constrictors, so everything has Python bindings, and everyone works from within Python. As it turns out, this is not an issue, Again, setting up the problem is what takes the time. The little runtime penalty that it has for setting up the problem in Python is very minor. Once it has checked the units and you know, build the things, etc., everything runs at blazing speeds in C++ and is fine. Uh, so this is approximately the same. You'll notice that it's uh, very similar uh, to, to one another. And now, so we have, uh, I cannot of course talk about all the computing problems that we have. It's a big universe, so we have very big problems. Here I just have like approximately how it would look in the implementation, uh, programming this right-hand side of the differential equations that we need to solve. Of course, this is just a simplified solution. So this is uh, where I see the, the, the power of C++ shining through, and I don't need to convince you of this. So here we just have some status, here's the right-hand side. We will pass you the, the vector of the states, y, and I want the y dot, the derivative of those given those states. Uh, assume that I can read the parameters somewhere. Here I just use this mu equal to one, appropriate units, and so on. Differential equations and just, you know, return me whether the radius was greater than zero, which it should be, right? Uh, of course, in reality, it's much more complicated. And there is one thing that we need most often and is the bane of my existence, and I hate to love it, and that is derivatives. We need derivatives, and they are so important. They are important for solution of nonlinear equations and for optimization. 
For solution of nonlinear equations, you need the first derivative. For optimization, you need the second derivative. And it's never of a single variable. So you need a Hessian. And it's sparse and it's massively large. And it's very difficult to compute. So how can you do it? You can do it with finite differences, right? You can just get the forward differences and you are order h. And as you know, this uh, f of x0 plus h minus f of x0, h is very small. So you have this uh, cat, you know, catastrophic cancellation. But then if you make h bigger to avoid the catastrophic cancellation, then it's order h. So then you go and reach for the you know, uh, central differences approach. That's order h squared. Much better, but it still has issues and you get the signs wrong and it's just a big pain. So then you can do also complex step differentiation. So this is true. Uh, I, I think it's very cool that that is true. If you evaluate the function of it, uh, at x0 plus i times h, divide by h and take the imaginary part of that result, that's order h squared, but there's no subtraction. So it's not subject to catastrophic cancellation and you can get numerical, like a, essentially full, full precision. It's as if it were analytical. So complex step differentiation is wonderful. Do I have to change anything on here to do any of this? I don't, because it's a template function, right? So this is what makes C++ remarkable. Fortran has an equivalent of templates. It just doesn't work like that. You still have to write it. It has interfaces. You, you still have to write it. But in the other case, I can just instantiate my function with a complex number, uh, get the result, extract the, uh, you know, at x0 plus 10 to the minus 8 times h, uh, times i, then get the result, get the imaginary part, divide by h, and that's it, I got it analytical. Go try it, it's wonderful. But that's really not the real deal. So I have here my class, real deal. The real deal is to do automatic differentiation. So have the computer, in this case the type system, do it for you. And this is, of course, I did not invent automatic differentiation, this is just conceptual. Uh, so let's go back to high school. You have a, 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 the real deal is my type, and has a value, and it has a derivative. So you remember how to take the derivative of a product. So u times v is a, so v times the derivative of u plus u times the derivative of v, right? So that, and that's it, that's high school. And then how do you take the derivative of sine? It's cosine, the derivative of cosine is minus sine. And every single derivative has a very simple uh, expression. So in this case, I just wrote this class. Here is just overloading the operator times. So the left, left hand side, right hand side, Everything has the value in the derivative. This is the value, so just multiply them. This is the derivative, again, v times u plus u times dv. Then for the sine is sine, that's the value, and the derivative is cosines times the, arg times the derivative because you need to chain rule everything, and that's it. Does it work? Let's see. This is a function, you know, uh, sine, cosine, return me this product, and this, this works, you can copy and compile it. And yeah, error zero. This is wonderful, this is what we need, and this is where C++ can come to the rescue. But this is still not good enough. So if there's any compiler developer here, I believe this can be done in Clang. And I believe this can be done at the compiler level, and somebody will come up with it, it won't be me, but they will just be able to receive an expression, uh, an arithmetic expression, and the, at the compiler level, emit the derivatives. Because you have already the evaluation tree, you can just you know, evaluate it backward and get it. This is the kind of hope that C++ gives you, if it can do this, and it can, and there are libraries that do automatic differentiation to any order and with the sparse systems, then you know we are on we are in a great spot to continue exploring the solar system. So okay, I've been rambling around. What do you say? What do you say you do here? So what do I actually do? Uh, so I my expertise are gravity-assisted mission design, so something like Cassini or Clipper, planetary protection, ensuring that uh, we do not bring Earth-borne pathogens to other uh, solar system bodies and that some solar system bodies that we get sample return from don't come and kill us all. Uh, Ephemerides interpolation, meaning where the solar system bodies are. Situational awareness, we have a huge problem with uh, so many pieces of debris orbiting around in space, and we need to be aware of what the situation, I guess that's where the name comes from, and uh, you know, avoiding this Kestrel effect, which would cause this you know, chain reaction and destroy our space assets. CubeSat operations, that's specifically what my startup is trying to do, is just, just provide uh, spacecraft operations as a service. And uh, my specialty as in core is trajectory optimization. And you know, C++, that's the thing. So that's the trajectory of Cassini. Uh, remarkable mission that if you were aware in uh, September 15th, it uh, died like a champ. And this is what it did, uh, approximately. <laughs> So Cassini was launched in 1997. Its objective was to study the Saturnian system, and it did so by flying by Titan. So it orbits Saturn, but it uses Titan as its engine. Uh, just for you to get an idea of how important is Titan as a gravity assist engine, the entire engine of Cassini itself had about 350 
meters per second of uh, available delta V. Fuel in a spacecraft is measured in their capacity of changing speed. So you measure it in delta V. You say it has so much meter per second. So Cassini had 350 total. And every fly by Titan gave us 800. So it is, it is, it is a massive uh, amount of uh, delta V. Mostly what you do when you fly a spacecraft in a gravity assisted mission, you don't use your fuel for anything but setting up the flybys so that you get this, this uh, gravity assist, right? So each one of the little dots, the, the white dots that you see here, are flybys by Titan. The ones that you see here are flybys of Enceladus. Uh, we found out that Enceladus has uh, plumes emanating from the South Pole, so therefore it probably has water. And I believe they are positive it's actually liquid water. And you know, water equals life, or so far as we know. Uh, other icy satellites, it has many satellites. And then at the end, we just entered into the uh, inner parts of the ring. We were orbiting from the out, then we came back from the inside, and then, you know, it just did its thing. Uh, I'll, I'll show a movie if we have some time at the end, which I believe we are almost there. Thank you. Um, so then Cassini is over. Is, does that mean that exploration of the outer planets is over? Of course not. The last thing I did before I left was being a member of the mission design team for Europa Clipper. So the next thing that we do is going to Jupiter with a very capable spacecraft orbiting the planet and uh, looking at Europa. It's the other moon that we believe that there is, if there's life anywhere, there is in uh, Europa. Europa is smaller than planet Earth, obviously. You can compare it to our moon. Uh, but if it does have water, and we believe we do, we believe it does, it has more water than planet Earth. And that is, you know, uh, volume going as a cube of the radius. And Earth is very shallow. The deepest uh, ocean on Earth is about 11 kilometers deep. Uh, in Europa, it would be like hundreds of kilometers deep. So there's more water there than here. And it, it is heating because it's uh, coming in and out of uh, Jupiter and then it has the chemistry. So let's see what we can find there. And uh, here is uh, the interplanetary trajectory, one of them. There's many ways to get there. This was just the one that I, uh, that I used for my design. Uh, so this is called an E-Vega trajectory, Earth, Venus, Earth, Earth, gravity assist. So you go to Earth, Venus, and then you fly by Earth, and then you fly by Earth, and then you go there. So that's why it's so loopy. And uh, then you come here to Jupiter. This is just zero, is that you use Ganymede to break uh, with a gravity assist. So this is centered in the sun. So that's the sun right there. And then this is centered already at Jupiter. And we start, uh, these guys right here are the flybys of uh, Europa. So you have first exploring one fourth of the hemisphere, then another fourth of the hemisphere, then another fourth of the hemisphere, and then another fourth. These uh, black lines are eclipses that we need to be careful for because it will be a solar powered mission. And uh, that's how a trajectory looks like. The color coding is just different phases of the, of the mission. So again, with the damn dot. So now, now, now what do we do here? So that uh, uh, initial picture that I showed you of the modern human anatomy is uh, actually a plaque that was put in the Pioneer spacecraft. Uh, that's how it looks in the actual the spacecraft itself. Uh, what it shows is, you know, uh, the, the human uh, inhabiting Earth it shows uh, some atoms. It shows our distance to different uh, quasars or pulsars. I don't remember. Encoded the distance in, bi in a binary, some sort of binary code. It so shows the Earth, you know, Mercury, uh, the, the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then that the little thingy came out of uh, the Earth is in a very childish uh, manner. The the other planets, and then this is this part over here. It looks like the antenna of a pioneer itself, and. Uh, the reason why we did that is because we wanted somebody to find it. Uh, so we just threw it like a bottle is thrown into the ocean, uh, hoping that somebody someday will know that we existed. So ultimately, that's uh, kind of what we are uh, doing here, just trying to transcend. And uh, the way we uh, you know, aim to do that is by exploring, and we try to understand to you know, make our own reality uh, understandable to us. And if we fail in doing that, at least to tell someone that we you know, sometime in this massive, massive, massive uh, extent of distance and time, there was a species that existed and that cared to look uh, a little bit farther. So uh, I believe I have a, a little bit of time. Let me try to show you this thing of my good friend uh, Cassini. Uh, da -da -da -da.
And of course, I don't know how to increase the volume, but well, if it doesn't work, just believe me that it's nice. Uh, <laughs> I'll put I'll put it uh, on on YouTube. Uh, well, it's on YouTube. I'll put the address on the. Uh, uh, it's just showing the, the the crash of Cassini. But if it doesn't have audio, we'll just you, we'll just do without it. So, if gravity is keeping you down, give me a ring, and uh, I can help you with your spacecraft. And with that, I'll finish this talk and take any questions that you may have. Thank you. How are the coordinates of the different bodies in the solar system tracked? Uh, how are the coordinates? How are they stored? Like, what is the f system that you store the okay, location yeah, of everything in? The great, great question. So, what, like, how do we store our rotations and uh, so our orientations, etc.? So, there is a frame rotation system. They can be stored as quaternions or they can be stored as rotation matrices. And uh, I prefer that when they are stored as quaternions because then you can get the derivative very easily. We often need the derivative of the rotation as well. Uh, and it's uh, just an abstract interface that is from base and then to base, and then you have the name of the base and the name of the target frame. And this forms a, a tree, right? And, uh, and this is one of those wonderful computer science problems that, of course, game designers probably have discovered this on their own. But you have this, this tree that has the base frame, and then the next frame, and then the next frame, and so on. And uh, if you just do this uh, breadth-first traversal from one to the other, if you look at it as a graph, it gives you the minimum number of hops between the two points. So it minimizes the number of transformations that you have to do. So the system functions a little bit like that. You are on an arbitrary frame. You need to get to another arbitrary frame. You breadth-first search it. You get the search graph. And uh, it gives you the transformation uh, chain. And the reason why it needs to be so deep, again, like in games, is because you have the camera, which is mounted on the arm, which is mounted on the spacecraft, which is relative to the sun, which is relative to. So it's a very, very extended chain. Which is the ultimate frame? Uh, the root frame. Yeah, what, what is the root frame of reference? There are two. So the official one is called ICRF, the International Celestial Reference Frame. And then you can uh, refer it to the ecliptic plane, meaning the average plane where the planets uh, orbit. Or you can refer it to the Earth mean equator of the year 2000 at 12 on GTC. <laughs> and uh, so again, it uh, doesn't matter what it is as long as it is something. And the one that is most commonly accepted is ICRF uh, frame. Then there's another one called EME 2000. And again, some of them differ by clocks, etc. But in the end, all your calculations will go back to ICRF. And it's, it's a published standard. If you Google ICRF, uh, you, you'll see how it goes. Of course, the work of many wonderful astronomers to come up with it. When you're solving the differential equations, how do you uh, determine the time steps for uh, to, to minimize error or whatever? Yeah. So it is, uh, it, uh, that's an excellent uh, question. It is adaptive step size. So uh, you cannot just, just, there's a lot of experience that goes into it, but it has to be adaptive steps. So you just have this minimization of the truncation error. You also have to be, give longer time steps to slow, to increase the propagation speed, the speed at which you get the result, and also make it a small, but not too small, because then you have truncation error. There's a, we use Adams methods, as opposed to Ranch Cuda, that are a little bit more uh, capable in their throughput and you know, error control. Uh, but yeah, error control in propagation of differential equations is a, an entire topic in and of itself. And there is also the simplicity, meaning that sometimes you need the energy to be conserved, which is not with uh, Adams or Rush Cura right. methods. Right. So there is the symplectic propagators. So, so you do correction for energy then? Uh, if you use symplectic, you just uh, you know get, for example, Jacobi's constant, and then it has to remain throughout the propagation. But those cannot do adaptive step size. So you have to just pick the step size and stick to it. And if you do uh, Ranch Cura or Adams or uh, you know whatever other method, then you have to accept that you will lose uh, energy. And uh, propagation itself, especially gravity-assisted propagation, is a chaotic uh, process. Mm -hmm. uh, so very difficult. It's very uh, hard to predict the future. Any parts of those that can be done analytically or not at all? Not really. So the two-body problem has an analytical solution and it still has to be iterative because Kepler's equation cannot be solved for the eccentric anomaly uh, analytically, so you have to iterate on it. But it has an analytical solution. But the three-body problem and onwards is proven not to have an analytical solution. Yes? Uh, can you give an estimate of what amount of computation is required to compute the breadth of formation like Cassini? Like supercomputer for days or like hours, seconds? Uh, 
the, the, the question is how, how long does it take to compute the trajectory of a mission like Cassini? Uh, not too long, I would say it's in the order of tens of minutes to compute one trajectory given everything else. To do the optimization of a trajectory is something that can take many hours. Uh, but for problems like planetary protection, where you need to vary the initial conditions a little bit, essentially you have a covariance matrix and you have to sample it to account for all the disturbances and simulate one time and another time. At the end you simulate millions or tens of millions of times. That takes many months. And one of the last thing I did is try just implementing that planetary protection system in a, you know, just to deploy on the cloud, everything in C++ from scratch, and uh, now it can be done in days. So in about a couple of days, you can get five million simulations for planetary protection purposes. Can you put over it this one-section problem? Yeah, um, you cannot dispose of a spacecraft uncontrolled. You, you need to throw it to the garbage, if you will. Uh, you cannot just say like, okay, it has stopped orbiting. So take Cassini, for example. It, it was out of fuel. It could have remained in the Saturnian system for, for whatever amount of time. But it could be the case, if we cannot control it, and it's just ballistically, that it could hit, uh, say, Enceladus and contaminate it. Cassini is carrying a nuclear material. It's irresponsible to do that. So then the NASA Office of Planetary Protection, which has uh, conventions with other international organizations, uh, requires everyone to dispose of it controlled. So we decided that it would be uh, you know, crashing it into Saturn. Uh, when you do a mission like uh, Europa Clipper, you could hit Europa if you don't pay attention to what you're doing. So when you have a nominal mission, uh, you extract the covariance, in other words, the uncertainty of every parameter of that mission, and you sample each one of them and assume that the spacecraft fails and determine in how many instances did the spacecraft actually hit Europa. And then, the, you know, you get probability of failure given, uh, impact given failure, of probability of contamination and so on. You make this Bayesian approach. And, uh, and that whole analysis is called planetary protection uh, uh, analysis. Yes, of course. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you run in any numerical problems? Like, what, what kind of uh, number of representations do you use? It, it, it is a, if we run into any numerical problems uh, in representing the transformations, everything that we do is in double precision. The only thing that has to be done in quadruple precision, which is only implemented in software, is the time for very precise uh, uh, ranging calculations. So our clocks are now super, super, super accurate. And they have USOs, the spacecraft ultra-stable oscillators. And sometimes to do the orbit determination, you need quadruple on, on time only. But everything else, double precision, seems to be good enough. Continuing on that question, do you need to modify reference frame in order to get better precision? Like, uh, if you're doing calculations around Saturn, do you try to make Saturn your reference frame in order to reduce the scales of the double precision? Absolutely. Um, uh, that is called center switching. And it's also represented as a graph, which also you, you just do the graph search to, to do it. So you have this tree. You have the sun and the, the, the very center of the planets orbits the sun. And uh, then within the very center, you have the, the central planet. And then you have the satellites of the planet. And then every planet or every body has something called the sphere of influence, so where the gravity dominates. So when you enter the sphere of influence of a body, this tree system does this search again, and then it puts, makes that the center, and then everything else is referred to that precisely to take advantage of the uh, being closer to the planet that is dominating. Then you get out, and then the center switches again. A uh, very do complex process. Well, it's not complex, it's difficult to implement. Do, do you get numerical problems when you switch spheres of influence? Yes, yeah. and, uh, and at some point you can only compare two trajectories that were propagated with the exact same algorithm. If I come up with my good center switching algorithm and you come up with your own, uh, it's normally accepted that we cannot compare them, uh, precisely because yours is a universe and mine is a different universe. So yes, they introduce errors and uh, to the point that they become like a, a, sing, a singular thing that has to be treated consistently. Thank you. Of course. Well, if there are no more questions, I appreciate you attending the talk. Thank you.